Okay, I am back with my friend Jessica, and she was telling us a little bit about the start of her journey with autoimmune brain disease. Jessica, can, can you just tell us a little bit more about what that time was like when you started experiencing the worst symptoms and how you went about getting a diagnosis? Uh, I have to really thank Susanna Callahan for her book because once I started thinking that maybe I had temporal lobe seizures, I reached out to her on Twitter and it was right around the time that her movie was premiering and I'm so grateful that she even responded to me on Twitter and she gave me her email and I reached out to her and said, I think I have what you have. And she said, here are my doctors. My doctor team happened to be in New York City at Lenox Hill Hospital, oh, which was a great. real godsend. And I also happened to have insurance at the time that I didn't need a, um, a referral. I could just go into a specialist, make an appointment, and be able to be seen by their, by their doctor team. So I originally went in for seizure activity, but I didn't realize that the unit she referred me to happened to be a, um, how do you say it, like an immunology, neurology department. So they were looking at the causality and because I hadn't had traumatic brain injury in the past and I hadn't had this kind of symptomology as a child, it was more, could this be a biological causation? And so they tested me for a lot of different autoimmune possibilities, a lot of different um, special specialty diseases that I even have a hard time saying the words. But I ended up having an antibody which is called Hashimoto. Um, oh my gosh, no, it's the, I'm blanking. It's the thyroid peroxidase antibody, which is the same oh, yeah. antibody that is correlated with Hashimoto. Yeah. But this disease is really specific because it's not, you're not diagnosed with thyroid Hashim, Hashimoto. You're just meaning, uh, the thyroid peroxidase antibody just means that that specific antibody has hijacked the blood brain barrier and has caused inflammation in the brain. So whereas I went in just for seizure activity, it just so happened that I got diagnosed with an autoimmune encephalitis like Susanna had. So it's really a, a massive blessing. And I really have to thank my doctor, Dr. Derek Chong, for being so generous with his time. I mean, he spent like 40 minutes with me each, wow. each appointment to really trying to problem solve and figure out what the solution could be. And that's amazing. Kind of because I can't of. get a doctor to spend in in New York City to spend more than ten minutes with me. I, um, yeah. So that's really great. But it must have been a scary diagnosis. So how did you deal with that, or were you just relieved to have a diagnosis? For me, I I'm just the person that wants to know, and I think there's um, I didn't realize that a lot of people are not comfortable with that. They don't want to know. I want to get to the bottom of it. So for me, the diagnosis was massively helpful. Getting the Hashimoto encephalopathy diagnosis, it's actually called steroid responsive autoimmune encephalopathy thyroiditis is the term that they use, one of those acronyms, is the term they use now instead of Hashimoto encephalopathy because of the confusion with the right. name. But for me, it was really, I was really grateful. But the one that was really hard to digest was the cognitive decline which is a result, of course, as the continued um, seizure activity and then the inflammation that causes um, brain, little brain injuries here and there that can be cumulative. So that, that definitely was scarier because the short-term memory and the long-term memory was gone. And um, Jane and I were talking before we started this, you know, the, those three years that the disease was at its real height, I have no memory of even my husband Chris will be like remember that time that we took this trip and I'm like it's it's so funny because I knew you throughout this entire like three years but I didn't know about your illness till later and to me you always seemed like super sharp super intelligent and confident so how did it how did it manifest itself like on a day-to-day -day basis like how did it affect your life I'm so glad that it seemed like that because I also had crippling social anxiety I not around me, you did it. I, I don't know. Oh my gosh. I, did, I, just, I, from the, I just remember when I first met you, I was just so inspired. You were so articulate and so I'm passionate. I'm so flattered. And um, I'm, that's um, miraculous. I'm, so, I'm amazed. Thank you so much. I definitely. It was so true. Nope. So I remember <laughs> when you told me this, I think over lunch, and I just had no idea, which does go to the whole thing. Like, you know, I've 
I've been suffering from some illness the last few years, and I am so cognizant of it that it's going on, but other people don't notice it. So it really, it yeah. is interesting. But what, what, like, what did it mean for you on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I think to your point, you know, the invisible illness thing is really hard for those of us who, who struggle with that. So it was, um, I just think I was so grateful for a diagnosis, but then of course I got on a lot of seizure um, medicine to try and bring the seizures down. And my particular disease, there's no, it's idiopathic. There's no real understanding around why it happens. There are some, of course, like conspiracy theorists and, you know, the neurology field is just, it's, it's uncharted territory. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I think that that part was hard and I don't know if you can relate to this and anyone who's watching, which is, have you tried yoga? Have you tried um, this I diet? Have. Well, yes. my doctor, maybe you should take, I, it's like, it's so overwhelming to deal with the um, beginning of the disease anyway, kind of wrapping your mind around the architecture yeah. of a diagnosis. Yeah. I think that was pretty exhausting. Um, I was really grateful for people that reached out. I look, I just actually had a conversation um, around of one of my dear friends, Kevin, he's going to be on um, my nonprofit's podcast. He runs a really cool organization in San Francisco that he started right around when the time I got the disease. And so I was looking through the emails to respond to a different email he had sent me. And I realized he had sent me like two or three emails, 2017, 18, and I just didn't get back to him, but I had no memory of it. So I wrote him back and I was like, almost all these friendships that I had those three years, I don't have any memory of. So I'm also really grateful for the friends that have stuck around and part of my disease just affected my, um, my ability to communicate. So this was something that came up in the traumatic brain injury support group that I go to at NYU. And I, I was just, again, so thankful. There was another patient who said that her relationships changed a little bit because she had no filter. And that's just, a, that speaks to like how your brain is so sensitive and all these different elements, seizure activity, yeah. or if there's any inflammation can also affect our, not only our processing and our cognitive functioning, but also our personality. Sometimes my anger just like was like that. I mean, I think I, crept it under control, but I know my filter was, was gone. And again, and nothing I noticed, but I certainly, I, right. I, I certainly, um, you know, could imagine how difficult it all was. Were you able to work in those three years? Were you able to I still think, work? I think I really happy? did myself in by trying to work because I created a self-defeating cycle that I'm working through now to try and, you know, rebuild confidence and self-belief and self-agency and just feeling like I'm capable because I was, I kept trying to get pro projects done. And I, since I run a nonprofit, I'm the founder of a nonprofit. We were doing a trauma platform, mobile health platform for trauma specifically. And I have no um, insight into technology until now, but those three years that I was the sickest, I was also trying to, you know, take an app off the, from beginning to lift off. And I mean, for someone who's healthy, that's really hard. But for someone who's sick, that's even yes. harder. And so I, I think I was trying to work, but I probably should have taken the time off. But I, like we mentioned earlier, Jane, about the invisible illness, I wish that I had like, I don't know, like both, both my arms weren't working, then it would make sense that I couldn't type and get my work done. Yeah. But yeah. because they weren't, I was like, oh, I got to try and push through, even though I could, I was sleeping 16 hours a day, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't wake up. Wow. So yes, I was trying to, but I really shouldn't have been. And I'm also on camera. So I do TV hosting as well. My background is in journalism. So I was, you know, doing those kind of projects as well. My memory was gone. So I really should have taken the time off. And I don't know how you have felt with this, but it was hard to feel maybe as an ambitious mm -hmm. person and someone who works in the service yeah. industry and in human rights. Like I don't yeah. have um, the stakes are too high for the work that I do, for the people I serve, for me to yeah. really take the time off if my body's still working. Yeah, me too. You and I had a very interesting conversation when you first told me about this at lunch because I was sort of in, in the opposite situation, whereas my brain was functioning fine, but my arms and legs weren't. So my brain would have all these ideas and I'd want to be typing away eight hours a day like I used to. And my arms were like, no, you can type 20 minutes and that's it. 
So it just, it's hard to, I think, work, especially we both work with the same population and it's very emotionally draining. So to be working while also trying to heal and take care of yourself is very difficult. So I think I'm gonna end this part now, but we are gonna be back talking a little bit about treatment and coping. So thank you so much and we will be back. Here we are back with my friend Jessica, who's talking about autoimmune brain disease that she was dealing with while she was also advocating for victims of human trafficking and sexual assault. So kudos to her to, for being you know, able to wage two, two uh, battles at the same time, one to help others and one, one to help herself. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about treatment and coping. So once you got the diagnosis, what were you able to do to help and to get better? Well, I think the real question is what should I have been doing? Because okay. I should have been resting and I should have been enjoying watching Netflix all day or learning how to embroider, you know, doing yoga. Those are things that I should have been doing. Yeah. I was on a lot of anti-seizure medication and I am realizing now that I'm, I'm feeling better I think that was the hard part back then is thinking like, are these symptomologies more seizures? Am I experiencing that? Because for 2017, there was seizure activity on my EEGs, but 2018, there, we didn't catch anything on the EEG. But as you know, there's right. a take home. It's like one in a million that you're actually going to have something yeah. when you're on the test. But since yeah. there was nothing for 2018, but I was still having some some symptomology, like a kind of a good amount. Um, and then into 2019, like half the year, still some symptomology. And now I was actually just reflecting on this, I think yesterday, that I haven't had any of that kind of symptoms or feelings because really? seizure That's activity awesome. is so ethereal. But yeah. now I'm looking back in 2018, 19, like, oh no, the, like that, me thinking that that, that like, feeling of deja vu, even though it might have been more minimal than it was in 2017, was still part of the symptomology now that I okay. haven't had any of it for so long. So I guess that was also part of dealing with it in terms of treatment was trying to nail down what is what, like what is stress and then yeah. if stress adds to it. And so the drugs, the drugs, but also, um, more trauma therapy because in my case, my brain is so sensitive and emotional um, distress is what stresses our brain the most. And because yeah. I have a high trauma history, when I would get triggered, then it would cause, like it would cause seizure activity, it would cause co cognitive decline, it would call yeah. this thing, cause this thing called um, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, which are a response to trauma. It's just, it is, my yeah. brain is so sensitive. So the, I think the harder part too, as part of the treatment, so it was drugs, trying to learn how to de-stress, which I wasn't very good at, and yeah. Um, boundaries. Yeah, it's and hard for type A like, people, like both, both of us, I think are. It's really hard to stop caring for others and take care of yourself. But I think yeah. you said earlier, like it's, you know, we would be better caring for others if we took care of ourselves first. Um, just a question, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but how common is this type of autoimmune brain disease? Like how many people, do you have any idea how many people in the world experience this? The, real, the really hard part is that doctors don't wanna test for it. I don't quite understand the thought process behind not testing for this one antibody. Because it's, and, and of course, as a patient, I'm like, what's the big deal? Just do another lab. I don't see what yeah. the problem is. But I think immunology and neurology as one department is, is relatively new. When I was diagnosed, there weren't that many people. But the common thought is that it's largely underdiagnosed and that a lot of what yeah. we see, for example, cognitive decline or memory loss might actually be a result as long term, um, as a long term consequence of this illness. But originally they said it's only one in a million. Now it's one, one in 200,000. But for a while it was very, yeah. very special. I, I think, you know, the, the autoimmune diseases I have, I'm told, are rare too. And I think they just don't diagnose the mild cases of it yeah. at all. They don't look for it. So was it just the one antibody test that, like, how did you get a, like, a confirmed diagnosis? Yeah. It's it was because the TSH, so the TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone, is normal 
for these yeah. tests. The spinal fluid um, testing is also normal. So it really is the thyroid peroxidase antibody. And I posted my journey a lot on social media. And so I had about five people that reached out to me directly and I introduced them to my doctor and they got tested. And I think three of them actually had the same antibody situation. And then two of them went into the hospital and wow. one of them now is, um, she has chronic seizure activity. She's, she hasn't been able to get rid of the seizure activity. So she has um, like a, oh my gosh, I'm losing my words today, but she has, she has the support dog for seizures. And the other girl did get treatment. So eventually now I think she's back at work, but that's just goes to say, you know, five, five people uh, of the people, I think I have like a cumulative following of maybe like five, Eight eight thousand people, and wow. of those eight thousand people, five reached out to me. Of those five, three got tested, two were positive. Wow, that's that's incredible. So you're still you're helping people now in a completely different arena. What is your prognosis? It sounds like the seizure activity has stopped for the most part, right? So is it just a matter of time? Is getting you better and better? Um, yeah. So anytime I see my doctor, I. I have three questions I ask my doctor every time I see him, which is clarity around, is this chronic? Like, I don't quite understand, is this chronic? And he says, I'm, I, he suspects I'm more sensitive to, like, for, for example, viruses or my immune system might be weakened. But, but comparatively to friends who have clearly weakened immune systems, I'm much healthier than them. I don't get as, as sick as, as frequently. But I think if I um, if I don't address like a, if I get sick and I don't address it, then then I'm much more sensitive to having a neurological chain reaction. Sure. So that's one of them. Constantly harassing okay. him about if this is chronic. The yeah. second one is begging him to get off my medication. And the last time I saw him, he really called me out because. I said, well, you know, I haven't had any seizure activity on the EEG. He was like, is this really about pride? And I was like, um, uh, just caught. And he was like, do yeah. you just want to see if you don't have seizures, if you come off the medication? And I was like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Accurate. I, would I just want to see if I'm it. healthy enough. Yeah. Like, am I imagining this? And he was like, um, well, that's not how this works. Maybe I can give you a Christmas present next December. We could get you off them. But for now, we have to taper it down. I was like, I can't do, believe. Do they have side effects? And my mail them? like that. Oh my gosh, I feel so exposed. <laughs> Does it have side effects like that that make you want to get off of them, or is it just because you want to see? It's purely pride. It's purely pride. I wouldn't call it pride. It would be wanting to know whether. It's curiosity it too. Yeah, curiosity. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it looks like you're getting better and better. So. That's great. I, I think the second guessing is hard because I, yeah. I have, I do have days here and there where I have memory issues or it's really, really hard to focus. And then I get paranoid. Like, is it coming back? Am I imagining this? Maybe okay. this isn't really happening. And then I will have friends that be like, oh, but you seem fine. Like you seem normal. Everybody goes through that. But then yeah. of course, having had the experience, it's like, well, if I hadn't been, um, if I hadn't gone down the web MD trail, if I hadn't gotten really hyper-focused on health journals, I would have never really self-diagnosed. I walked into the doctor's office like, this is what I have. That's so what that's, I did. That's what I did. Yeah. It's so like, I, this is so funny because this interview is about you, not me, but over and over, I want to be like, oh my gosh, that's me. Like with, with my, I'm clearly getting better with my arms and my legs, but there yeah. are days, right? When I backtrack and on those days, it's a mental game of like, wait, am I really getting better? Was I just imagining totally. it? Because right now I don't feel so good. Maybe I was just like trying to, you know, pep my, you know, give myself a pep talk and maybe I convinced myself that I was getting better and I'm really not. Like it is a right. mind game, right? Yeah. Especially because things go up and down instead of just like, you know, like just getting better, getting better. There are days where things peak back up and it just messes with your mind. Mm -hmm. right? um, mm -hmm. What advice do you have for anyone else going through something? I c imagine when you first got the diagnosis, yes, it was relief to have a name, but it still must've been scary. So for someone out there who's either got this diagnosis or experiencing similar symptoms, what advice do you have for them? Be curious. 
learn how to self-advocate for yourself, really find allies, patient um, advocate allies, find support groups, the traumatic brain injury support group. Even though on paper, I don't have a traumatic brain injury listed, there are of course two types. There's a concussive a traumatic brain injury or external one where you get hit. And then there's an internal one, which is like a biological response. And so I fall into the second camp, but having the traumatic brain injury support group has been massively, massively helpful. So definitely community going to counseling to help process everything. And the fallout of that might be boundaries. Um, so that was a really difficult part was, was cutting, I, as, as my husband likes to say, building space between people and myself what, during that time that it wasn't yeah. healthy for me, that it was, that wasn't helpful for me. And yeah, I would say community is really the big one. And I know, I, I know in theory, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, like lessening stress. I don't know what that means exactly, but I agree with that. Yeah. I, I was on a call recently about burnout and somebody said it, every, I think really well. They said, maybe it's not about lessening stress. Maybe it's about finding what nurtures you rather than what's good for you, what nurtures you. Oh, that's a good idea. Cause I mean, especially in the work that both of us do, cause we're in the same arena, it's hard to reduce stress. You know, it's, it's, yeah. And somebody said to me too about our work. And I would say this is relevant for anyone watching maybe who feels pressure and obligation. Um, and in some respects, at least for our career where we're doing human rights work or where you're in a, maybe a teaching capacity, you know, people, there are people whose entire lives are dedicated to supporting these causes and the work will get done. Like if it doesn't get done by you, it will eventually get done. There are people out there who are working on this. And yes. I'm just like, oh, <clears throat> there <And> are. <laughs> yeah. No. And if you need to take the time off, you know, I didn't take any time off for the first two years and I think it did hinder my recovery. There is a part of you that wants to just pretend everything is normal. And so yeah. I think the taking time off is an admitting to yourself and to the world that no, you're not like, okay. And I, that's scary, but I do think that it helps in the long run. And it's hard yeah. to be helping other people when you yourself are not feeling well or not doing well. Yeah, um, I know. I know that. I know that. I'm still working on it though. I think that's, yeah. a, that's something I'm still working on. Yeah, me too. Me too. And I'm trying to take this, you know, the time of the coronavirus, which we're or in otherwise this interview would have been in, perfect, in person because I would love to see you in person. I am like, there's extra downtime on the weekends, you can't go out and I'm really trying to be like, okay, you need to rest, um, but it's hard. You know, our mind yeah. is always racist. I'm sure what you need to do for your nonprofit is really hard. Um, yeah. But anything else you wanna let people know? I think this has just been so inspirational. I, I mean, I personally think that your story just gives hope it's, you know, you, you did, it's a rough couple of years, but you seem to be getting better and better in time. Um, but it is important to get the right doctor. I mean, I, I might just from highlighting your own story, you made the point that you had to do your own research. I'm a huge believer in that because especially mm -hmm. I know very much about the thyroid antibody you're talking about. Um, because I had that sky high for many years and every doctor was like, nope, it means nothing. Your, your TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone is normal. So it doesn't matter what your thyroid antibodies are saying. And I'm like, how could it mean nothing when, um, I was talking to this offline, like I think the reference range for that test was zero to two and mine started at a six and then it went to 30, then it went to 80, then it went to like over 200. And every doctor said, nope, that means nothing. And it turns out actually that that antibody is also related to myasthenia gravis, which I have. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard though to get a doctor you know, they see thyroid antibodies and they think thyroid. And if they're not willing to spend more than five minutes with you, they're not going to take you seriously. So the advocating for yourself, I think is really important. Um, so I don't know, do you want to, if there's anything you want to speak a little bit about it, you said you went into the doctor knowing kind of what Yeah, you I would had. say become an expert in your own disease, become okay. an expert on understanding labs and um, pharmacology. Uh, I would say look at medical journals and then find the doctors who are um, doing those studies and reach out to their teams and reach out to their departments is a way to really get your, um, 
get the right people in the room who are passionate about this, I recommend going to a teaching hospital rather than just a regular hospital. I think teaching yeah. hospitals are eager because they're curious about what's going on. Yeah. They want to teach med students, you know, different yeah. types of diseases and we're fascinating cases. Yes. Um, right. Yeah. When yeah. you say I about that, like the, the, they're though they are, especially the students really fascinated by interesting cases, mm -hmm. whereas your average doctor is seeing 60 patients a day, got five minutes with you is not looking for anything out of the mainstream. So I, I actually, yeah. Yeah. And they're on burnout. They're have so many, yeah. I mean, they're getting swamped by electric, um, electric, uh, electronic health records. Yeah. I, I mean, they're up against the admin. So I can have, com I have a certain amount of um, grace for the fact that they can be horrible patient with patient care. But I would say, don't let your, I say this in human rights, but I would say this is applicable for, you know, illness. Don't let your anger paralyze you, let it um, move you. So become the expert in your own disease. And again, like, yeah, I know those labs and, and really be curious. So you mentioned the thyroid peroxidase antibody for this specific one that I have the, I think marker is zero to 54. And mine um, was like, it was like 250. And then we got it down to 56 over 2017. And then it skyrocketed up to like 800, I think. But somebody wow. else could have 2000 and be asymptomatic. Yeah, somebody could yeah. have 125 and, and have heavy symptoms. So you really have to learn how to uh, yeah. how to figure that out. So marking your symptoms too was after, really critical for me. Is like making patterns of my symptoms. So daily marking them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's some more about that on my website about how to take your own, how to write your own history to give it to a doctor. But just I mean, for anybody out there, because both Jessica and I have gone through this where doctors didn't take you seriously at first keep going until you find someone who does take you seriously. And I agree, teaching hospitals, and you have to be a bit of your own investigator. Mm -hmm. um, but I hope this story um, shows hope because through it all, Jessica has been continuing her incredible work with her nonprofit and is, is, is recovering slowly. I know it took you much longer than you thought, but it shows that there's just light at the end of the tunnel and it will get better. So thank you so much for doing this interview with me today, Jessica. And thank you also for, for being for your friendship and being such an inspiration. Same.